go ahead. Awesome. Thank you very much, Soren. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, I'm really glad that you're all here for the 11th edition, I think, of uh, Great EU. Um, this conference has been a, a, tr a tremendous, uh, tremendous success over the years and really a, a, a giant asset to, uh, to the community. And uh, so I know that I speak on behalf of not only the Groovy and the Grails team at Object Computing, but really the, the whole community um, in uh, thanking the, the great folks for uh, continuing to put the show on and continuing to do such a fantastic job of putting the show on. And we definitely appreciate the opportunity to come talk about uh, what's new and exciting uh, uh, every year. So uh, I'm, uh, we're really grateful for, for the conference and uh, are already looking forward to, uh, to being back next year. So I'm um, glad that you're all here, and uh, we've got a lot of exciting stuff that we'll be uh, talking about and announcing, announcing this week. Um, but this morning, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is GORM Data Services. Um, this is a technology. Uh, so GORM is, is a technology that we started, uh, that we created uh, over a decade ago. GORM has been uh, part of Grail since the very, very beginning. Um, we, uh, we first released, or, or we released Grails 1.0 in February of 2008, um, so more than a decade ago, and the framework predates 1.0 by more than a year. So, so the, the, the framework, the Grails framework, has been around for a long time, and GORM has been an important part of uh, the framework um, since the beginning. There's never been a version of Grails that didn't have GORM um, as, as part of the framework. Um, GORM has evolved a whole lot over the years. So GORM uh, today is very different than GORM was um, a decade ago or even five years ago. A lot has changed in GORM and a lot of that has to do with evolving the framework to be uh, more and more um, in line with the way that people want to build applications today. So GORM was, was originally conceived to be a layer on top of Hibernate, right? Hibernate is the, um, the de facto standard ORM tool for the JVM. If you're building JVM apps and talking to a relational database and you're using an ORM tool to do that, there's a very good chance that you're using Hibernate for that. It's just by, by far the most widely used ORM tool on the JVM. So what we wanted to do with GORM uh, was we wanted to build a, a layer on top of GORM that we could leverage inside of the Grails framework to take advantage of a lot of powerful capabilities that Groovy has to offer to enable us to more easily take advantage of all the capabilities that Hibernate has to offer and add a bunch of capabilities on top of Hibernate. So that's initially what GORM was. It was to make it easier to take advantage of Hibernate, more closely integrate with the Grails framework, and add a bunch of capabilities on top of what Hibernate had to offer. Um, and uh, so that was great, and uh, people, uh, people enjoy that. For the first year or two of GORM's existence, I guess maybe the first year, um, one of the most highly voted feature requests for GORM was JPA support. Uh, people wanted to be able to pull out Hibernate and plug in Toplink or some other JPA implementation. So we recognized that and refactored GORM to de decouple it from Hibernate, and then you could plug in any JPA implementation you like, and people like that. And then fast forward a few years past that, and the so-called NoSQL databases started gaining a lot of traction and momentum. You had databases like MongoDB and Cassandra and these non-relational data stores. Um, there, was a, there was a whole gaggle of, of those kinds of databases or non-relational databases that started gaining attention around the same time. And shortly after that, folks started clamoring for wanting to use GORM to talk to those kinds of databases. So we refactored GORM even, even further, and today you can use GORM with Hibernate, you can use GORM with JPA, you can use GORM with MongoDB, with Neo4j, which is a really interesting graph database. So GORM has evolved a lot over the years, and that's been an important part of what's kept that particular technology um, relevant and exciting, and, and uh, people still want to use it. Uh, it's still an important part of how a lot of people build um, uh, build uh, uh, web apps today. Um, not just web apps, any applications that need to communicate with databases. But GORM has been around for a long time and is, has evolved a lot over that, uh, over that time. What I want to uh, uh, start with uh, as we press into some of the technical details, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, so some historical aspects of GORM, some, tech, some uh, capabilities that GORM has had since the very beginning, and uh, then uh, pretty quickly, I want to get to talking about um, uh, uh, newer uh, capabilities that we've added to GORM in, uh, in recent years. And in particular, we'll talk about GORM data services and, and detached criteria and some things. But I'll start with a quick discussion about uh, the fact that GORM supports 
a number of mechanisms for expressing your queries, right? An important part of what the ORM tool needs to do is provide a mechanism for you to query the database. And um, uh, so th there are a number of ways to do that with GORM. GORM supports dynamic finders. GORM supports a so-called criteria API. GORM supports uh, what we call where queries, which are really, really powerful, really interesting uh, uh, mechanism for querying the database. And GORM also supports HQL, um, which is maybe the, the least interesting of, of these options. Um, when you give GORM HQL, we don't even look at it, we just give it to Hibernate, and Hibernate does what it does. But we've got a, uh, a number of mechanisms for querying the database. And dynamic finders are one of those. And dynamic finders are a really interesting um, capability that leverage Groovy's dynamic dispatch to do some things that you can't do with other, uh, at least you can't easily do with other programming languages. Things like calling methods that don't exist, right? If you have a person class and the person class has a first name, a last name, and an age attribute, dynamic finders let you do something like you invoke a static method on the person class with a method name that is something like find all by age greater than the words age greater than, and then uh, you pass a number as a parameter to that method call. So that method find all by age greater than doesn't exist, um, but GORM allows you to invoke that method, and if the method name follows certain conventions, we're able to intercept that method call and turn that into a query that can be sent to the database, right? Because everything that we need in order to formulate the query is expressed in the method name and the parameters you passed. And that, that's, that's a, a, a slick mechanism for querying the database, and, and there are some, some specific benefits to using an approach like that. And really the main one, in, in my view, is expressiveness, right? When you look at a method call that is something like person.findall by age greater than, that, that's easy to look at, it's easy to make sense of, it's very expressive, it's easy to read, it's easy to write. That's what's compelling about dynamic finders is they're, they're very expressive, right? So this is a list of operators you can use in a, um, in a dynamic finder. You can find by first name in list, find by age less than, find by uh, date between, and so forth. So you can use any number of these operators. You can use ands, um, so you can say find by first name and last name find by first name and age greater than. Um, and you can use ors. Um, what you cannot do is mix ands and ors within a dynamic finder method, but you can use ands, you can use ors, uh, you, you can't use them both, right? And this is just a, a couple of simple examples of dynamic finders, like bookmark.findall by title like. So what that's going to do is send a query to the database to retrieve all the bookmarks that have the word grails in their title, right? That's what that's gonna do. Um, and, and that code, by the way, will work with, if we're using Hibernate, it'll work if we're using some other JPA implementation, it'll work with MongoDB, it'll work with Neo4j. So that, that's not Oracle code, and it's not MongoDB code, it's GORM code. And GORM knows how to intercept that method call and, and do whatever it takes to carry out that query in whatever implementation you're using. So if you're using Hibernate, uh, GORM for Hibernate, that uh, method call results in one set of things happening, and if you're using GORM for MongoDB, that exact same code results in something different happening. So there's a lot more to dynamic finders. Uh, we're not gonna uh, spend a whole lot of time pressing into that, but dynamic finders are one of the ways to query the database. Uh, uh, one of the limitations of dynamic finders has to do with the benefits of dynamic finders. So dynamic finders are expressive. They're easy to look at, easy to read, easy to write. One issue with dynamic finders is if you start, um, if, if you have a lot of criteria, so if you have a method that's something like find all by first name and last name and age greater than and state in list, you get this really long method name and it's hard to read, right? It's hard to figure out where the ands begin, where, the, where do the individual properties break up, um, and you lose the expressiveness. You lose the real value of a dynamic finder if you write this really long uh, screwy, hard to read method name. Uh, that's one of the places where dynamic finders start to fall apart, is if you have a lot of criteria. Another is if you need, if, if your criteria is complicated enough that you have to navigate the object graph. So maybe a person has an address, and an address has a mayor, and a mayor has a wife. So one thing you cannot do with dynamic finders is you can't say, give me all the persons that have a mayor whose town has a zip code that has the number three in it, right? You can't navigate the object graph like that with dynamic finders. So two, we'll say two of the limitations with dynamic finders are if you're querying based on very many properties, that starts to fall apart, and you can't navigate arbitrarily deep in the object graph. Gorm, Gorm, uh, dynamic finders don't, don't support that. 
So those are two of the limitations of dynamic finders. Um, the, the criteria API um, kind of addresses both of those. Um, so if you've got lots of uh, criteria, so you want to query based on first name and last name and age, and, and uh, you want to navigate the object graph, so you want all the persons that have mayors whose zip code is equal to, so you want to, you want to navigate the object graph as part of your criteria. The criteria API um, uh, makes that pretty easy to do. Again, I don't want to press super deep into the syntax here, but uh, that's an example of a criteria API. This is going to find all the bookmarks that have comments that have the word grails in their text. The date created for the comment was in the last week. The bookmark was uh, uh, created in the last 30 days. Um, so, so, so you can query based on any arbitrary number of properties. Uh, you can query on lots of properties, and you can navigate the object graph. Those are some of the benefits of um, using the criteria API. And for a long time, my position uh, on which query mechanism to use is uh, use dynamic finders for simple queries that only have one or two properties on them, and for everything else, use the criteria API. Um, because just about anything you might want to express, you can express using the criteria API. That was my position uh, for a long time, but before where queries uh, came to exist. Where queries um, were introduced um, uh, around the, the Grails 2 timeframe, so they're not brand new, they've been around for a little while. Um, and these are, uh, uh, where queries have a number of really compelling attributes um, to them, and we'll talk about uh, just a couple of them, maybe three of them uh, here today. So where queries use a detached criteria API, we'll see a little bit of code that, that, that illustrates what that's all about. Um, where queries are compile time type checked, uh, which is great, that means uh, if you have, uh, well, well, we'll look at some examples and I'll describe what that means, but they're compile time type checked. Um, they're statically compiled, which means they're very, very efficient, very fast. They use raw Groovy for criteria, which is an interesting aspect. If we go back to look at the criteria API, this also uses raw Groovy, right? Those are Groovy method calls. They might not look like method calls, but they are. Where you see the word comments there, and then there's a closure after comments, what you're doing is you're invoking a method named comments and passing a closure as a parameter. And then inside of that closure, you're invoking a method called like and passing two strings as parameters. So that's all raw Groovy code. The, the same is true of dynamic finders, right? This is all Groovy code. But where queries use raw Groovy for criteria in a fundamental way. And as soon as we look at uh, sample code, you, you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about there. And where queries are composable. So let's, let's address all of those, those things there by way of uh, looking at some examples. So here at the, at the very top, that first call to uh, person.where, and we're passing a closure as a parameter, inside of that closure are raw groovy, Boolean expressions in Groovy. So age is greater than 19. Home address.town is equal to St. Louis. And there's a lot of sophisticated stuff you can express in there. But you've got these Boolean expressions that are just Groovy code, right? You're not making a method call into some API. They're raw Boolean expressions at the, at the language level. And uh, that's how you express your criteria when using, the, um, when using where queries. So this particular query will return persons whose age is greater than 19 and then the second part of the criteria there demonstrates how you can navigate the object graph. So it looks like persons must have a property in them called home address, and home address must be of some type that has a property in it called town, and you can navigate arbitrarily deep. You could say home address dot town dot mayor dot, and uh, you can navigate arbitrarily deep there. So the ability to use raw groovy expressions um, to describe your query criteria uh, is, is fantastic, right? You're writing Groovy code, um, so you're not, you're not uh, uh, context switching here. You're not writing SQL or HQL. It's not another language, it's, it's Groovy. Todd, you had a question? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, it's no problem at all. And before you uh, get started, uh, definitely don't hesitate to speak up. If you have questions, uh, uh, let me know and we'll address them. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot you can do inside of these Boolean expressions. So um, you can have a, um, for example, for regular expression checks, you can have equals equals tilde, and it'll do a regular expression check. Uh, you can use dot contains. Uh, I think you can use in 
Um, so you, you get to do things that are very natural in the Groovy program. So if you were thinking about a, uh, an expression in Groovy code, never mind the database, if you want to know, does a list contain a value, there's a way to do that. That syntax works inside of your where, where query. And that's, that's what I was getting at back here with uses raw Groovy for criteria. They're, raw gro they're Groovy expressions that, gets, uh, that represent your, your uh, uh, query criteria. That code inside of that closure, at least th those Boolean expressions, never actually get evaluated, um, which surprises some folks. In order, it, so, so if those expressions actually got evaluated, uh, think about how that could possibly work, right? If we were going to evaluate an expression, age is greater than 19, there'd have to be an age thing, right? It, it almost looks like what we're probably doing is sending a query to the database, retrieving all the persons, iterating over them, and then executing this code. And that's not what's happening. Uh, of course, that would be a terrible idea. Uh, that would have uh, obvious problems. What's happening is at compile time, we have an AST transformation that finds these calls to dot where. And at compile time, we're interrogating those instructions that are in the closure and generating all the code that is uh, GORM code that knows how to go send a query to the database. But the expression age is greater than 19 never actually gets evaluated. It, um, it instructs the compiler what you're trying to express inside of that closure, and then we can generate all the necessary database API interaction code at that point. Uh, so those expressions never actually get evaluated. If you have other arbitrary code inside of that closure, it'll be uh, evaluated. So you could have if conditions inside of that closure, and the if conditions get evaluated at runtime. So you can have conditions that are only part of your criteria under certain circumstances. So for example, at the very top there, uh, we've got two different conditions. Age is greater than 19 and home address.town is equal to St. Louis. You could wrap one of those in an if condition that says if some condition is true. So if we're supposed to query based on age, then call age is greater than 19 inside of that if condition. Um, so, so the code inside the closure in general gets executed and you can put any arbitrary logic in there. But these Boolean expressions that represent your qu uh, query criteria um, do not for the reason that I cited. Yes, sir. The, uh, the question is, is this still statically compiled? And the answer is yes. Um, so we're generating the instructions to interact with the, um, uh, uh, with the, uh, the GORM API to create your criteria objects and so forth, and all that stuff is statically dispatched. There's no reason to turn on dynamic dispatch for any of that code. So all that is statically compiled. In addition to being statically compiled, uh, all this code is statically type-checked. Uh, so one of the things that means is, so there where it says age is greater than 19, if you have a typo there and you misspell the word age, or how, however you spell age, if there's not a property in the person class that's spelled that same way, the compiler will complain about that and say, hey, you can't do that. Contrast that with all the other query mechanisms, right? With a dynamic finder, that's not what happens. If you call uh, bookmark.findall by title like, and you misspell the word title, that code compiles just fine. It's important that you're allowed to call methods that don't exist in Groovy. So the fact that that method doesn't exist is, is no problem for the compiler. And at runtime, you're going to get an error that says, hey, there is no property called whatever, however you misspelled title. The same thing is going on here, right? So where that says um, like text percent grails, so the word text there must be the name of a property in the comment class. And if it's not, this code still compiles, but you're going to get a runtime error that says, hey, there's no property called text. Uh, contrast that with the way where queries work and uh, recognize that uh, with where queries uh, at uh, static type checking time, we make sure there really is an age property in the person class. And uh, not only that the property exists, but that the type makes sense. So for example, if it was a number, if, if age is an int and your criteria was age is equal to equal to Jeff, that's invalid, right? That an int could never be equal to Jeff. So static type checking is going on as well as static compilation. So that first call there, um, that, that call to dot where, uh, does not communicate with the database um, at all. N no communication with the database happens when you call person dot where. Um, what's returned from person dot where is a detached criteria object. And there are a number of things you can do with that detached criteria object. But what that object represents is it, it represents all of your criteria. Um, so what's returned from that call to where is an object that knows how to send a query to the database that will return all the persons whose age is greater than 19 and their home address.town is equal to St. Louis. But no communication with the database has happened yet. 
One of the ways to actually send the query to the database is to invoke the dot list method on that detached criteria object. And that's what you, what you see happening here. So we call where, we get back the query, and then call dot list on the thing. Um, so I see this a lot, um, and, and it, it, it's fine, it works, and it yields the uh, desired results. Um, but uh, something that a lot of folks don't, uh, don't recognize is there's a convenience method called um, find all that is shorthand for this. So if you're just gonna call where and then immediately call dot list, um, instead of calling where, call find all. And what's returned from that is not the detached criteria object, it's the result of having called dot list on the detached criteria object. So th this pattern here where you see code that calls dot where and then immediately calls dot list and that's all you're doing with the query, uh, that's fine, but just understand that that could be shortcut, uh, uh, could be shortcutted, and instead of calling where, you call find all, and then what's returned from that is the results. And all the find all method is doing is calling where, getting the thing back, and calling dot list on it. So it's, it's really not a big deal either way. It's just a line of code that uh, you don't need it, need there. Uh, the question is, how do you handle pagination? Um, so. The list method and other query methods you can execute on a detached criteria object uh, accept an optional map, map parameter, and the things you can pass in that map parameter are the same things you can pass to any other GORM query method. So you can pass things like uh, the max, uh, maximum number of rows, the offset, uh, sort order, um, uh, all, all the same parameters you could pass to person.list, you could pass to this query.list. All right, so uh, in, in, that, in the case of that first uh, query there, there's, no, there's really no good reason to have a reference to the detached criteria object. So I'd probably call uh, find all instead of dot where. But the code uh, at the bottom of the slide demonstrates uh, why you might, well, one of the reasons you might want a reference to the detached criteria object. So def adults equals person dot where age is greater than 18. Uh, remember, no communication with the database has happened yet. All we've done is created a criteria object that represents whatever you've got expressed in your closure there. So I could call adults.list, and that would send a query to the database, and I'd get back a bunch of person objects. But in addition to calling person.list, or instead of, I'm sorry, instead of calling adults.list, another thing I could do is I can, I can invoke adults.where, and now I've got a whole other set of criteria that I can add to the criteria that was used to create the adults object, right? So now, at the, at the end of the line, if I call adults in stl.list, the criteria that are in that thing is the union of age is greater than 18 plus address.town is equal to St. Louis. So I can compose these queries. So I can have one query that, has, uh, that describes what does it take to be an adult. So you have to be greater than 18, you have to be X, Y, Z. Whatever criteria it is that describes adults, that could be inside of uh, a one where query. And then separate from that, I can have another set of criteria that describes what does it mean to be um, a St. Louisan, or what does it mean to be an EU citizen, or what does it mean to be uh, whatever. I've got another set of criteria, and if I want to combine those two, if I want all the adults who live in St. Louis, um, I can do that and by taking advantage of the where queries uh, composability. So there's a whole lot of cool stuff we can do in where queries. That's really the default query mechanism that I use for just about everything. Remember, uh, so the reason that I preferred uh, dynamic uh, finders for certain things is they're very expressive and um, uh, they're easy to read, easy to write. Contrast that with what you see here. So age is greater than 18 is very expressive, right? I think that's just as expressive as using a dynamic finder. Plus, I get all the benefits of where queries. I get static type checking, static compilation, better performance. Um, so in recent versions of GORM, as cool as dynamic finders are, I, I practically never use dynamic finders because where queries have all the benefits that I perceive in dynamic finders uh, plus more. Um, I'm really not giving anything up when I use where queries uh, compared to dynamic finders. The same is true with the criteria API. So I would practically never write a query like this uh, anymore. So in recent versions of GORM, uh, pretty much all of my queries I'll express using the uh, where query API. And there's a whole lot more to the where query API. We've gone as deep as uh, I wanted to a lot of time for today. Uh, happy to talk about more of that if, uh, if you've got questions about that uh, later, but uh, let's press on. So another, in addition to, uh, separate from introducing where queries a number of years ago, in uh, recent versions of GORM, so versions as of GORM 6.1, which is a couple of years old now, I guess, um, we introduced a new technology called GORM Data Services. And GORM Data Services are super duper cool. Um, with GORM Data Services, uh, we can generate most of your data service layer for you. Um, in a mechanism that uh, allows you to write very, very little code. The code is very expressive. 
The code is compile time optimized, so your interactions with the database are going to be very efficient, very fast. The way that, uh, that we put this together, we'll see some examples here in a minute. You'll see why they're very easily mocked, um, which is great. Often you want to mock out your data service layer, and, and that's very, very easy to do with GORM data services. Um, so GORM data services really contributes to productivity, and uh, they're just really, really cool. So I'm going to start by way of looking at a really, really simple example, and then we'll work through some uh, uh, slightly more involved uh, examples. But here is an example of a GORM data service. So a GORM data service can be as simple as an interface that's annotated with the service annotation. And inside of that interface, you define abstract methods that represent your interactions with the database. And the GORM data service uh, compiler stuff can generate the implementation of this class for you. So we're, we're going to work through a number of examples and get an idea of what kinds of things I can do in a GORM data service. Um, for now, um, I'll point out that the method names the return types and the parameter names and types. Uh, in various, uh, in certain circumstances, any one or some combination of those three things are, uh, are, are uh, part of expressing what this method is supposed to do. So for example, this method begins with the word get. The fact that book is after it doesn't mean anything. Could, it could say get publications, it could say get Jeff, it could say get anything. The fact that it returns get, or, or the method name begins with get, and it returns a book, tells us a few things. One, this is a query method, and it's a query method to retrieve a particular book. Not a list of books, but one book. Right? So get book returns a book, it accepts an ID as a parameter. So if I were to call that method and pass an ID as a parameter, what I'm going to get back is the book whose ID is that, or null if there is no book whose ID is that. Um, and so uh, as long as I follow some conventions with this abstract method signature, the compiler can generate all the logic for me. And we'll see some examples of things. Um, uh, uh, we'll get a, a really good sense for the kinds of things you can express in that method signature. Right, so you're writing an interface. You're not writing a class. Um, and at compile time, we're generating a class that implements this interface. And inside of that class is all the stuff that it takes to interact with the database. So I could inject that service into some other bean. So in the context of a Grails app, I could inject that service into a controller, and now I could interact with us. Uh, so in my controller, when I call bookservice.getbook, that's my way of querying the database. In recent versions of Grails, in recent versions of the scaffolding plugin, uh, maybe m many of you have noticed that when you generate scaffolding for a project, now we're generating not only a controller and GSPs, we're generating a controller and a GORM data service and rigging the service up to be injected into the controller just like this. So we've gotten the database logic out of the default scaffolded controller into a service where it belongs, and we're injecting that service into a controller. Uh, so, so that represents a, a reasonable best practice. In addition to writing an interface, um, you can also, GORM data services also supports abstract classes. So you can write an abstract class, annotate that abstract class with at service, just like you can annotate an interface. And uh, the way that works is all the abstract methods in that abstract class get treated the same way they would if you were writing an interface. And then all of your concrete methods, your non-abstract methods, uh, get left alone. Um, uh, uh, sort of, well, they're not left alone. They're, they're made transactional by default, but the logic inside of the method is your logic. So you can put arbitrary logic in, in the method is, is the point there. And we'll see an example on the next slide here. Um, be aware that when you're writing abstract classes that you're using as GORM data services, all of the public methods in those services are made transactional by default because that's normally what you're going to want. And if you've got a public method in, in your abstract GORM data service class that you don't want to be transactional, then you need to express that by marking the method with at not transaction. So here's an example of an abstract class being used as a GORM data service. Um, so there are two abstract methods here. One is called getbook, and another is called getauthor. And uh, because they're abstract, our compiler is going to generate implementations of those methods based on what we can figure out based on the return type and the names and the parameters. So getbook and getauthor are, are pretty self-explanatory. We can tell if I call getbook and pass an ID, I'm going to get a book back. If I call getauthor and pass an ID, I'm going to get an author back. The return type there is important, right? That tells us what you're, what you're querying for. And then we've got a method here that has our own arbitrary logic, right? So I've got a method called update book. It's a public method, so it'll be made transactional. Um, it accepts two parameters. It looks like a book's ID and an author's ID. 
We'll call the getbook method to retrieve a book from the database. If the book is found, then we'll go send a query to retrieve the author. If the author is not found, we throw an exception. If it is found, we connect the two and save the book. Uh, but the idea here is you can mix and match. You can have abstract methods that Gorm Data Service is going to implement for you, and you can have your own concrete methods that do whatever it is that you want to do. Right? All that makes sense? All right. So the query methods in your GORM data service, there's a lot of stuff you can express in your uh, uh, in GORM data service methods. Um, so if a method name begins with the word count, then that tells us uh, what that method is supposed to do. It's supposed to send a query to the database to ask how many records are there that satisfy some criteria. So it could be count books, count publications, count Jeff, count Chocula, it could be count anything. If it begins with the word count, it's a, it's a count method. If it begins with count by, the, the word by means something special. Um, so what comes after by is uh, any expression that would be valid in the context of a dynamic finder. So you can call count by age greater than, count by first name and last name. Any expression that would be valid in a dynamic finder can come after the word by there. Um, and we'll look at some examples and talk about some issues with uh, method names versus parameter names. So a little bit more on the dynamic finder syntax in just a little bit. If a method name begins with delete, it does what you think it does. So the, uh, you need to pass an ID as a parameter to that method. We'll delete the thing by ID. Um, you can query the, the database using find, get, list, or retrieve. And uh, it could be find books, list books, find publications, find all the books, find anything. Right? You can put anything behind any of those four words. And whatever's after the word find, get, list, or retrieve is, is of no consequence unless what immediately follows find, get, list, or retrieve is the word by, in which case now you can, you're into the dynamic finder structure. So you can say find by age greater than, retrieve by age greater than, right? So if the word by is there immediately after find, get, list, or retrieve, then everything after that in the method name uh, follows the dynamic finder uh, structure. Uh, you can use, uh, so uh, you, would, you would just use find by. Uh, now I'm trying to remember if uh, all by is supported. All by is not required. What indicates if you're returning all or not is the return type. So if we jump ahead here, those aren't dynamic finders, but they could be. Uh, notice the first two return a list of books. The second one returns a book. That tells us whether it's find all or, or, or find by. Uh, save, store, and persist, um, uh, same kind of thing. That, that's a way to persist instances to the database. And we'll see, uh, we're going to see an example. So I don't see an example coming up. But if we had a method called save book, that method could, could accept a book as a parameter, in which case you create a book and pass it to that method, and it'll, it'll be persisted. Um, another thing you can do is you can have a method called save book that accepts discrete parameters. So book title, author name, number of pages. Uh, a problem or a, a thing to be aware of with that approach is if you're passing in the discrete elements required to create and save a book, you have to account for all of them, right? So if a book requires a title, an author, and a number of pages, and you have a method that only accepts a title and an author, uh, that, that can't work, right? Because we can't save a book without a number of pages. So if your entity has a lot of attributes, then uh, that might be an argument against having the method that accepts all the discrete parameters, but th that's entirely up to you. You get to decide whether you want to pass in the book or you want to pass in all the individual attributes that make up a book. Uh, you, you get to decide. Um, and the update, uh, update methods do what you think. They update uh, uh, persistent instances. The first parameter to an update method has to be the ID, and then after that you can have some other parameters. So let's just uh, press on and start looking at some examples here. And uh, by way of example, we can clarify a lot of the capabilities. So here's a GORM data service that happens to be an interface, could be an abstract class. Um, so we've got two find books methods. Um, the first one accepts a string parameter, the second one accepts a string and a map. Um, in both of those cases, the parameter name is important. So string title, the word title there, tells us what property you're querying on. So the, uh, the book class could have a title property, an author property, and so forth. So if the, if the parameter there was just string s, there'd be no way for us to know which, quer uh, which uh, property you're trying to query on. So the parameter name, the, the name title there is important. That tells us what property you're querying on. And if that parameter name does not correspond to a property in the, in the uh, book class, you'll get a compiler error uh, because we're statically type checking uh, those parameters, which is good. 
Uh, the overloaded version of the find books method that you see here accepts a map. Um, all of your query methods in a GORM data service method uh, accept this optional final parameter that's a map. And in that map, you can specify all the same kinds of things you can express when you call book.list. Um, so you get to specify max and offset and sort order, all the stuff we uh, mentioned earlier. So all of your query methods optionally support that uh, overloaded method that accepts a map as the, as the last parameter. And find book, um, uh, the, the difference between find book and find books is not really about the plural and the method name. So we don't do anything special with the plural and the method name. Um, what makes the first find book method different than the first find books method is the return type. So if you return a book, that tells us this query is supposed to return the first book whose title is whatever you pass as a parameter. The first method will return all the books whose title matches whatever you pass as a parameter there. So the return type is significant in all these cases. They, they indicate whether we're supposed to be selecting all or selecting one. Right? Uh, when you're using the dynamic finder style method names for GORM data services, uh, be aware that they're statically type checked. So if you make a mistake in the method name, find title and author, so you misspell title or author, that's a compile time error, unlike what happens with dynamic finders. Um, where that's a runtime error. With GORM Data Services, we're able to make that a compile time error, which is, uh, which is good. The parameter names are not significant when you're using dynamic finder style methods because the method name indicates what you're querying on. We're querying on title and author, and we're querying on title and author because the method name is fine by title and author. The parameter names often will be the same. So I would call these parameters title and author, but on the slide, I've named them title and writer to be clear about what's going on there is that the parameter names are of no consequence when you're using dynamic finder. So it could be string S1, string S2. Don't do that, right? But uh, you'll, it'll generate the exact same code. The parameter names are of no consequence when you're using the dynamic finder style method names because the method name expresses what you're querying on. Make sense? It's good, all right? Um, GORM Data Services supports projections, right? So maybe a, the book class has lots of properties in it. A book has a title, a publisher, an author, a number of pages, has all, comments, has all kinds of stuff. And uh, I just want to know all the release dates for all the books, for whatever reason. I'm going to generate a report or something. Um, I don't need book objects. I just need a list of dates. So I can call find book release date, and this particular example returns a single date. So I'm going to get back the date of the first book whose title is whatever I pass as a parameter there. Um, I could also return a list of date, and the same thing would work, but I'd get back all the dates. But in, in this case, we're not creating book objects. We're not retrieving all the data from the database that it takes to make a book object. We're not creating book objects. If we're using Hibernate, those book objects are not being post-processed because they're not being created at all. Uh, this is a more efficient way to retrieve uh, all the dates than uh, would be the case if I just retrieve all the books and iterate over the books and retrieve their dates. So when you're sending queries to the database using an ORM tool, and really you just need a couple of attributes, you don't really need these whole objects, always consider using projections because they'll be more efficient, they're, they're gonna be faster, they're not gonna use as much RAM. Um, so let the ORM tool create O's for you, right? Create objects for you when you can make use of those objects and when you don't really need the objects, uh, uh, maybe evaluate that and figure out, do you really want to pay the cost of instantiating those objects and having them post-processed and all the stuff that has to happen? Proxies have to be created. And in some cases, you might argue, yes, I want to do that even though I don't really need the book object. I do that because it's easy to look at, it's expressive, there's nothing screwy here that I have to explain to people, it's obvious what's going on. And if you're working on a system where uh, whatever small bit of additional overhead is involved in instantiating the objects, if you don't care about that, uh, that, that might be fine, right? It's not always the case that you always have to do the thing that's absolutely the most efficient. Um, just understand what's going on, right? So if you don't need the objects, uh, you don't have to have the objects created. Yep? Uh, yep, it's a good question. So the question is, how does uh, GORM Data Services know which date? And the property name is in the method name. So find book release date. If there was another date called publish date, we, we wouldn't have a problem here. So the, the, it's a good question. So the, the property name is in the method name. Release date is the property that we're retrieving. There could be any number of date properties in the book class. And by the way, if there's only one, that doesn't put us in a position where we'll just infer that that's the one you wanted. You have to express which one you want or the, the code won't compile, right? 
The question is, does it also support streams? And the answer is no, today. Today. Today is Monday, right? All right. Um, so write operations. I can save books to the database. Um, so here we see a couple different examples. We've got a, a save book method that accepts a title. We've got a save book method that accepts a book. Um, presumably, the, so I, if, this, if this code works, then title must be the only required attribute in the book class. Otherwise, that first, first method would, would never work. Um, I can delete a book by ID. I can update a book by ID. And uh, when you're updating a book, the first parameter needs to be the ID. And then after that can be any number of parameters. And uh, the parameter names correspond to property names in the book class. So we want to find the book whose ID is equal to whatever we pass as the first parameter. And we want to make its title whatever we pass as the second parameter. Yes? The question is, can you pass a map with several properties to update? And I don't think uh, passing a map I of properties is supported. Yeah, so one thing you could do is, so if that didn't return a book, if that returned a list of books, uh, well, you're updating by ID, so there's, on, there's only going to be one of them um, because you're updating by ID. There's not a mechanism that we've seen yet uh, for doing exactly that, but let's, uh, let's jump ahead. So another thing you get to do um, with Gorm Data Services is you can use the where query syntax for expressing your query. If you want to write the, the uh, logic yourself, you can do that. So you can annotate one of your abstract methods with at where and supply a closure. And inside of that closure, you can do anything you can do in a where query. In fact, we're using the same compiler to compile what's inside of that closure. Um, when you do that, um, inside of the closure, you've got these raw groovy expressions that are just Boolean expressions. The left-hand side of every one of those expressions has to correspond to the name of a property in the domain class, so in this case, in the book class. The right-hand side of each of those Boolean expressions correspond to the names of parameters to this method. And again, often they'll be the same thing, but here I've given them different names on purpose. So title equals title. The title on the left refers to the property name in the book class. The title on the right refers to the argument to this method. The next parameter I've called just date. So we see part of our criteria is release date is greater than date. Release date must be the name of a property in the book class or this code wouldn't compile. And date is the name of the parameter to this method. And uh, I would name them the same. So I would change this me method signature to be string title comma date uh, release date. But just understand what's going on there is the parameter names are the things you can reference on the right hand side of the Boolean expressions and uh, the property names are the things you can reference on the left-hand side of those Boolean expressions. And you can have any number of them. You can and them together. You can or them together. You can group them with parens. You can have A or B inside of parens and C. Um, you, the, the Boolean expression can be as, as, as complicated as it needs to be. Um, so uh, what is this going to do? This is going to delete all the books whose title and uh, release date match the parameters that you, uh, that you pass in. Um, I can search uh, using the same sort of thing. So this is going to find all the books whose author name and uh, release date match uh, values that I pass as, uh, as parameters there. So GORM data services are a really, really simple mechanism. There's a lot more you can do than, than, I've, uh, than we've looked at in these couple of slides, but uh, that should give you a sense for the kinds of things you can do in a GORM data service. And pretty much um, uh, all, all of my data service layers, at least a significant part of my, my data service layers in recent versions of Grails, uh, are always implemented in GORM data services. Because these are interfaces and abstract classes, they're very easy to mock, right? So if we went all the way back to this controller that was using the uh, book service, is that right? Yep. Um, so if I wanted to plug in a mock version of that book service, that's super simple to do. I can plug in anything that implements the book service interface, right? Because book service is an interface. Uh, the same would be true if it was an abstract class. Uh, so GORM data services end up making um, your code that uses your data layer, not the data layer, but the code that uses your data layer, makes that code easier to test because you don't end up with uh, any kind of concrete uh, dependency on your JDBC implementation or your Hibernate implementation or, or any particular implementation. You end up with a dependency on this interface that's easy to mock and, and provide test implementations for, which is good. All right, uh, a couple quick things. So uh, GORM 
as, as I said before, has been usable uh, or has been part of Grail since the very beginning, so over a decade. And really, GORM has been usable outside of Grails since the beginning, but uh, for most of that time, in order to use GORM outside of Grails, you had to wire a bunch of stuff up yourself. It was kind of, there were a lot of hinky bits. It was really tightly coupled to Grails. As a practical matter, uh, people didn't use GORM outside of Grails. Even though it was possible, it really wasn't designed for that, and uh, it wasn't a great story. In recent versions of Grails, uh, really as of GORM 6, um, I said recent versions of Grails, I meant recent versions of GORM, GORM 6. Uh, GORM is absolutely, so, so we kind of revisited the whole thing, and uh, specifically with the goal of making it easy to use GORM outside of Grails. And today you can use GORM in any JVM app. You can use GORM in Grails, in Spring Boot, definitely with Micronaut. We've got a whole bunch of cool GORM stuff in Micronaut. You can use GORM in any JVM application. Um, so the steps to do so are summarized here. You declare your dependencies on the, on the GORM libraries, annotate your entities, which is something you don't have to do in Grails, but you do have to do when you're outside of Grails. You have to initialize hibernate. Again, that's a step you don't have to do inside of Grails. And then you're off to the race. So just quickly, uh, you'll see, so I can add some dependencies on the GORM libraries to my build.gradle or my uh, pom.xml. Um, I need to annotate my entities, right? So I, I write my domain classes just like you might in a Grails app, but you have to annotate them with that entity. And the reason for that is in the context of a Grails app, we have a way to know which of your classes are domain classes, right? There's a convention you follow. You put the source code under Grails app slash domain, or Grail, uh, yeah, Grails app slash domain, and because the source is declared there, we know it's a domain class. Here, we're talking about using GORM outside of Grails, uh, so we don't have such a convention, right? We can't look at a class and assume that you want that thing mapped to the database, so you have to explicitly annotate your uh, entities with add entity. You don't have to explicitly implement the GORM entity trait. You see that here, um, and uh, a lot of folks will do that, uh, and that's fine. Uh, that trait is added to the class at compile time, even if you don't express it. The reason some folks want to explicitly declare that dependency is uh, if your IDE doesn't know anything about GORM, you'll still get auto-completion for all the GORM methods because they're declared in that interface, so, or in that trait. So you can implement the GORM entity trait uh, explicitly. If you don't, it's gonna be added to your class anyway. So at runtime, it's gonna be a GORM entity. And the reason you might be explicit about it is to get some better help from your IDE. Two minutes. Uh, yep, so we've, uh, we've done that. We've added some dependencies on the libraries, annotated our entities. Now we've got to initialize Hibernate and then go use GORM. So I can initialize Hibernate uh, by creating the Hibernate data store. I need to pass some information to that object so it knows where my database is. And there's a lot of stuff I can configure there. Uh, but to, let's just say that I've initialized the Hibernate data store and now I can go about my business doing GORM stuff. If I were to just call person.list down here at the bottom, uh, we'd get an error that says uh, there's no session bound to current thread, right? Lots of Hibernate developers are used to seeing that in different contexts. So I need to, to execute that call to person.list in some context where a Hibernate session is available. And one way to do that is with uh, uh, person.withNew session. That'll open a new session. Now inside of that closure, I can do whatever I want to do with Hibernate. And then when the closure completes, the session will be flushed. And, but I have to kind of manage that session myself. If I'm using GORM data services outside of Grails, which is totally supported and, and totally slick, uh, then I, I don't have to do any of that. So I can declare my GORM data service like I would um, otherwise and retrieve an instance of that service from the uh, uh, data store. And now notice that I'm not doing the with new session. I'm not uh, starting a transaction. I'm not doing any of that stuff. Uh, I can directly interact with this GORM data service that I retrieved from the data store and all the transaction management and session management stuff is happening for me. So that code, literally that code right there could be pasted into, th that's executable code with nothing else missing. That could be the whole thing. So if that were in a main method or if that was in a script in your project and you had defined these other things, so you had a dependency on the appropriate libraries, you wrote the person class, you wrote the uh, GORM data service, uh, that code will run and will work. Super simple to use GORM outside of Grails in uh, recent versions of, uh, of GORM. Uh, so I have about negative 20 seconds right now, so uh, I'll wrap it up right now. And I'm happy to, uh, uh, I'm going to be here all week. Um, please come by the object computing table and let me know if you've got any questions. If you want some Micronaut stickers, swag, shirts, any of that kind of stuff, come see me. And uh, I'm, I'm going to hang around here and answer questions as long as there are questions, but I want to wrap it up because we are out of time. Quickly, we'll take one question and then... Uh, 
It would be awesome, uh, so uh, the comment is, it would be really awesome if there was a version of this to use with Java, and I agree with that claim. And with that, I better stop talking. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right.